Um, I'm Stella Duffy. I'm a novelist, a theatre director, a theatre writer, and I am also the founder and the co-director of Fun Palaces. Um, I wasn't here at the very beginning, and I'm leaving as soon as lunchtime comes, uh, because um, my wife had major surgery on Tuesday, which turned out to be a lot more major than we were hoping. So I'm really sorry I'm heading off, but it's kind of joined up. It's kind of joined up to the health and well-being. It's kind of joined up to everyone, an artist. My wife's a playwright, and having had really major surgery on Tuesday, she's sitting up in bed this morning writing. She's sitting up, and I had breast cancer for the second time last year. As well as uh, starting the first Fun Palaces, I also finished a novel, wrote a play, and directed another one. There is something about artists that is driven to create. What I really mind is when we suggest that only professional artists are driven to create, that only people who are given the title artist with a capital A are driven to create. I think it's a lie. I think it's a lie that has been created by the professionalization of the arts in the past 50 years. I remember that our Arts Council was not set up to provide for professional artists, but to provide for amateur artists returning from the war. And I think we have done all of ourselves a major disservice in making this massive divide between professional artists and everyone else. Because you know what? I'm also everyone else. When I wrote my first novel, I was working as an actor. So I wasn't really a novelist yet. I've written 15 now. They're published. Sometimes when you say I've written 15, they go, oh, are they in the drawer? Um, no, they're actually published. Um, and, and I wasn't a writer then, but that didn't mean, I mean, I wasn't a professional writer. It didn't mean I wasn't a writer. I've just finished a novel that's taken me four years, and I wrote it out of contract because I knew that it wasn't the kind of thing that my regular publishers, Virago, were going to be after. And um, one of the reasons I, I, I kept on with it, and this is why, you know, I've never had a, profession, a proper job in my life. I'm 52, I don't have a pension, I've never had compassionate leave, holiday pay, or sick pay, and as I said, I've had cancer twice. I am driven to make and driven to create, and I'm also bloody lucky because I understand that people like me can be an artist. This didn't happen by chance. I mean, it did happen by chance, it didn't happen by intent. What happened was, I'm the youngest of seven. I've got a five-page speech, I'm not even looking at it. I'm the youngest of seven from a council estate in southeast London in Woolwich. My mum and dad both had to leave school at 14 because they were children of, from 1921. They came of age in the Depression, there was no money. All of my siblings had to leave school at 16 because we had no money. I'm not an artist because I'm so amazing and so fantastic. I'm an art well, I am. No, I'm an artist because I got the great good fortune of my family moving to my father's um, homeland of New Zealand when I was five years old. The New Zealand education system was very different for working class people in the 1970s. It too has been decimated. What that education system did for me was it encouraged me to start thinking for myself. I also had the great good fortune of moving to with my parents because they were economic migrants, a small town where there were 26 languages in my primary school, where half of those languages were Polynesian and Maori, where half of those languages, therefore, were languages from an oral storytelling culture which said you don't need to be able to write to tell stories. You don't need literacy to tell stories. You just need to be able to to speak. What that did was it made me think, wow, I'd love to be a performer or a writer, but people like me, poor people, white working class people, we don't do that. We didn't know in my family artists and writers. How could we? We lived three hours drive away from the closest theatre. We borrowed books from the library. Wow, let's save the libraries, right? But we didn't have any other access. When I was 15, a touring Shakespeare company came to the school I was at. Now, I know that there are some of you in the room now going, oh, thank God she's talking about excellence and quality. <sighs> You're shit out of luck. That company, in retrospect, wasn't very good. They just weren't. They weren't very good. That wasn't the point. The point was, about halfway, this is 1978, right? Anyone my age will know that Starsky and Hutch were on the telly then. There was a blonde one, there was a brunette one. There were two guys, they were doing two-man Hamlet, both playing La Hamlet and Laertes and everyone else. I mean, it was a great show, but in retrospect, they weren't amazing. About halfway through, I realized that the guy playing um, Hamlet who was the brunette one, looked a bit like Starsky, and then I realized I knew him. He was my, my best friend from primary school's big brother. 
That changed my life. Someone whose dad worked in the same mill that my dad worked in was an artist. Someone was like me and working in the arts. It breaks my heart when I see people paying hundreds of thousands of pounds, putting a world-class artist up on a stage in front of a bunch of kids who've never even seen a stage before in their lives. They don't need that. They need to know it's them. They don't need to be reminded how terrifying the arts are and how they'll never attain that. They need to be reminded it's them. Which brings me on to Joan Littlewood and the Fun Palace. So all of that is part of why I'm here, and all of that is why I care about it. In 1961 or 1958, God knows who, who, when, because Joan's book is, you know, a work of great fiction as well as truth, as anyone who's read it will tell you, and anyone who loved Joan will, will assure you that's true. Joan Littlewood and Cedric Price, the maverick architect, got together to design the Fun Palace, one building to house them all, all the arts, all the sciences. It was going to be free, it was going to be accessible, it was going to be open and available to everybody. And the Arts Council's response to that was, unfortunately, Miss Little, we, the Arts Council is interested in something Miss Littlewood isn't, full stop. Art, full stop. That was in 1966, I've seen the memo. Anyway, they went on and they pushed and they pushed and it was going to be digital and it was going to be linked and it was going to have everything and it was going to be free. And it was going to be in the East End where Joan had noticed that people were not going uptown to the big shows. They weren't going uptown to the shows that they were seeing at the Theatre Royal Stratford East. They were not going uptown because they didn't believe uptown was for them. It's exactly this idea about, yes, why on earth shouldn't Cy Twombly be in this building? Absolutely right, yeah? People want the work where they are. You know, fun palaces don't need to be rebalanced because we had 75% of our fun palaces out of London this year. 64.8% last year, but we're doing better. Eventually, we're going to get 100% of them out of London. No, it's not true. Anyway, this idea was for one building, and it was going to be amazing, and it was going to be open to everyone. And if you walked in, you might you know, be going to a lecture on mechanics, right? But on the way, you might pass a band, and they might be playing something. And when the band finished, because Joan was not about the us and them of audiences and performer, that band would get off the stage, and they would teach you how to play because she believed so strongly in the genius in everyone and so strongly in the idea of everyone an artist that the idea was it would be passed on. We do know, don't we, Room, that Mozart was not a genius? Do we know that? Do we, do, do we know that his big sister is supposed to have been a better composer but her work didn't get sent out because she was a girl? Do we know that their dad made him a scale model violin when he was three and he was the town's best violin player? You might be Mozart. You don't know, because your dad didn't make you a scale model violin when you were three. <laughs> it's really serious. We don't have the cure for cancer or for AIDS or for Ebola because we are not educating the whole world. We cannot say this person is talented and that one is not because we don't have a level playing field on which to judge people, which is why the question of quality and excellence is always a dodgy one. Anyway, back to Joan. So they had this fantastic idea and they pushed it and they pushed it and they pushed it and it never happened. The building never happened. There were a couple of artist-led fun palaces. Um, uh, Keith Orban did one and Margate. There were a couple of them, but they weren't the fun palace Joan wanted. They weren't the fun palace that brought all the arts, all the sciences, all the people together, and they weren't always free. Fast forward to 2013, when I was at Improbable's annual Devoted and Disgruntled. Some of you in the room, I know, attend Devoted and Disgruntled events. And I called a session that was, would anyone like to do something to celebrate Joan Littlewood's centenary on the 6th of October 2014? Something that isn't another revival of Oh, What a Lovely War. As it turned out, there were 150 of them. And we started talking about the Fun Palace. And we started talking about how it was never built. And then we started talking about maybe how buildings aren't necessary. How maybe we've got enough buildings. How maybe we just don't use well enough the buildings we've got. How maybe not enough buildings have yoga facing the sea. Good on you guys, that's amazing, I want to come. How maybe, what if you used all those offices that are empty at night and we know that there are brilliant people among our cleaners? What if we set aside a desk and said, if you're half hour break, you know cleaners mostly get a half hour break if that. If you're half hour break, here's a small, well-lit, quiet place for you to write that novel you've been trying to. 
What if we believed everyone was an artist and we enabled everyone to create astonishing things? We would have a better society and we would be acknowledging that people in the councils are professionals too because they might be artists as well. Anyway, this idea came up and I went, yeah, yeah, I'll run with that, that's fine. And I tweeted it because Twitter is my friend. If you don't like Twitter, it's your fault, you're following the wrong people. Seriously, it's like shouting at the television because Jeremy Kyle's on. Turn it over. If you don't like Twitter, you are following the wrong people. What happened was I tweeted, oh, we might be making some fun palaces for Joan's centenary. At the time, I had a novel to finish and two plays to direct. Um, I was not a producer of a major national event. Um, and uh, suddenly, and this is why Twitter's my friend, because I was following the right people. Erica Wyman, who'd just been announced as um, Deputy Artistic Director of the RSC, she went, oh, I'm in. And Gemma Bodine at the Liverpool Everyman went, I'm in. And Mark Ravenhill, he of shopping and fucking fame, went, I'm in. And then all those people who were following them looked at me and went, who the hell is she? Oh, God, should we be doing this amazing thing? Um, anyway, then very quickly it rolled. And we had the RSC and the South Bank and the Manchester Royal Exchange, the Liverpool Everyman and this building and loads of places saying, yes, we'd like to make a fun palace. And then we had to work out what it meant. And by last October, October 2014, we had 138 fun palaces up and down across all of Britain, all four nations, um, in Sweden, France, Germany, Australia, in, in the bush, um, in a library in the bush. Fun palaces, in our opinion, and this is the modern version, are free, local, innovative, transformative, and engaging. They're free because it is no point in saying your 10 quid tickets will get people in. Ten quid tickets are not engagement, they're not participation, they are just marketing. And that's fine, but let's acknowledge that they're marketing. They are local, because local people know better what they need and what they want than, than anyone else. And local people are better placed to lead and to run their fun palaces. This has been proved time and again in the whole two years we've done it, but we've got some evaluation, we're getting there. They are innovative, just do anything different, do something different, but the difference that is most exciting is inviting other people in. This is what Joan talked about all the time, the genius in other people, the genius in everyone. Stop assuming that we arts professionals are the only ones who know anything yeah it's possible we don't know everything transformative using the building in a different way using the space in a different way last year there were fun palaces in forests fields parks and Brockwell Lido swimming pool um, the, the gym, which is a fusion, London gym, just went, yeah, come in, use it. They brought arts and sciences together in a totally different way and engaging. And, you know, engaging is such a loaded buzzword for us now. I think we're going to just start saying easy instead because it should be easy. And what we talk about with Fun Palaces is we say ask the community, not give them a survey and ask what they'd like and then put it on for them. Ask them what they would like to do with the building. And I've been talking to the Royal Academy about this, and I'm going to keep talking to the Royal Academy about this, because you know what? I only knew that that courtyard was free to access. I knew I had to pay to go into the building. But I only knew that courtyard was free to access when a friend, who was a friend with a capital F, took me along, right? Those people, with all of those great big buildings, these people with these small buildings, smaller compared to those ones, need to be saying, come in and use our space, but not always on our terms. I promise you, if you ask the community, they have amazing ideas, and that slightly begins to answer the local authority question. Because this year, we had all 11 libraries in Lambeth made fun palaces. And what they did was they opened them entirely to their community, so the council didn't have to pay hardly anything. The Arts Council gave them a really tiny small G4A and like not even the whole 15 grand one and they made 11 fun palaces that enable community people to feel ownership of the buildings they are already paying for if it is a publicly funded building we are already paying for it how astonishing to have ownership over the building you already pay for People came in and they used the spaces. They talked to each other. They created new liaisons. It's only our second year. We're learning as we go, and we're about to begin a big ambassadors program, set, talking to people in the regions. We want to be devolved desperately within at least 10 years because it shouldn't be run by the four of us in our part-time office in London. We do two days each a week, and there's four of us, and we've, we've created this astonishing thing, not because we're so brilliant, really, but because the time is right. It's a 60-year-old idea from Joan Littlewood and Cedric Price. It was based on other things before. It's called the palace because it references the people's palace. 
and it's called fun because Jonas Cedric believed that learning should be fun, engagement should be fun, and that arts and sciences belonged to everyone. Jones said everyone an artist or a scientist. We say everyone an artist, everyone a scientist. And we say please join us because honestly, this is a revolution and if you don't join us, they will knock your doors down anyway. <laughs> Thank you.